thank you for uh, the opportunity to, to share some of the work uh, that we have been doing in Mexico. Uh, first, I have to acknowledge that this is this the research that I will present today is part of the carbon monitoring systems sponsored by NASA. It's actually two grants. Uh, so the first grant is, is this one, and then this is the current grant that uh, that, that, that we're working on. And uh, I have always to, to start saying thank you for my to my collaborators. Uh, there are many people uh, named there, but they are scientists in the United States and scientists in Mexico. Of course, students and postdocs working working in, a, in my lab and across different labs. And also because of how carbon monitoring systems work, there is also the engagement with the stakeholders. And in this case, we have worked with the U.S. Forest Service, but the main stakeholders are the Mexican Carbon Program, which uh, it's, uh, it will be uh, something similar as the North American Carbon Program, but folks for Mexico. Uh, the Mexican Forest Service, which is uh, CONA4, and uh, also the National Commission for Biodiversity and Conservation, which is CONAVIO. So we have been working with these stakeholders to engage uh, uh, different scientists and different groups across Mexico. And if you have any questions, please stop and say, hey, that's it. Uh, I want to start the talk, putting it into a, a regional context. When the audience know what was the, the soccer report, soccer 2, you have heard about that. It's a few people, right? Well, soccer, soccer 2, it's a, it's, a, it's a second stage of the carbon cycle report, and it was published in November of 2018. Uh, it came out also the same day that the National Climate Assessment came, so that one get all the news, and then the the, the, the software report was on that one was the same day. But uh, one important thing is that it was it was uh, commissioned by the U.S. Global Change Research Program, and there were many scientists involved in this report, and also it took several years to um, to finish. But really, this report provides a state, uh, um, a current state of the science assessment of the carbon cycle across North America. But also, uh, it is based on the multidisciplinary research. So it brought together the scientists from different disciplines, from different areas, working on carbon cycle science, from uh, oceans, coastal ocean, uh, uh, terrestrial ecosystems, atmosphere, etc. But it also brought together uh, 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 scientists working on the social sciences. So, okay, yeah, we will have a different, uh, a diverse audience that will reach out uh, for uh, for this assessment. And uh, it was uh, follow, but this this assessment was uh, was following the soccer one, which was about a decade ago. Uh, and it brings together information from Canada, United States, and Mexico, trying to make it a complete understanding of North America. This is kind of where the information was coming from. Uh, North America, understanding the continent of the United States, but to include Hawaii, Alaska, Canada, and Mexico. United States, a lot more information. We actually have some domains within the United States, and Canada and Mexico, less specific information. And if you read the summary, one of the key uh, knowledge gaps is that we don't have that much information about Mexico. So although we try to incorporate that, there is still uh, information that is missing. And uh, doesn't mean that information doesn't exist in Mexico. It's just that information has not yet been published. And one of the requirements for Soccer 2 was that we were only going to be able to use published information. So a lot of things that I'm going to present today, they just got published or they are in the process of getting published. Plus there are many colleagues that are working on, 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 on carbon cycle science, but because how Soccer 2 was, uh, was uh, uh, there were the guidelines, that information was not able to be incorporated into the report. I was uh, participating in chapter two. I was a co-lead of this chapter along with uh, my colleague Dan Hayes. And this, this uh, chapter two was a summary of the carbon cycle science across North America. Um, one important thing is that it incorporated CO2 and methane fluxes, although the talk of today I will be focusing mainly on CO2. Some key findings of the chapter two, and I'm not going to read all these, but uh, check the, 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 um, the language, very high confidence or very high confidence or medium confidence of all these. Basically, uh, there are uh, carbon emissions from, uh, from uh, fossil fuels, but some of those fossil fuel emissions can be offset by terrestrial ecosystems. Um, although, from that offset, we will have medium confidence. Something that 
probably a bit more important for this audience, of course, even more of interest, is that one of the findings of this chapter is that the, uh, there is an apparent convergence or apparent agreement between top-down and bottom-up estimates for the uh, terrestrial well, continental carbon sink. So um, for a top-down approach, it's about uh, 699 kilograms of carbon per year, whereas uh, a bottom-up approach is about 606 kilograms per year, but see the confidence intervals. So there's a large, this is an exciting uh, finding because if we see the, the history about the estimates of the North American land atmosphere CO2 exchange, we can see information from 2007 from inventory or the top down um, and then going all the way to 2018 and see this apparent convergence. There's a lot of questions on this, like why is this convergence? Is that uh, the bottom up estimates are getting more accurate or the top down estimates are getting more accurate? Or is it just simply that we are just within errors on this uncertainty? So this is an area of research about why are we getting this apparent convergence of, of, from these two methods. But what is, 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 uh, it is uh, it's important to recognize is that as we are moving in time, we are incorporating more and more source, sources of information across North America, and uh, hopefully that is giving us this, this convergence. This is going to be tested, and uh, uh, we need to understand the different carbon pools that are across North America. And this is also part of chapter two. And uh, here you can see the carbon pools, the total biomass for Canada, United States, and Mexico, the sun for North America, and then the total in soils. There are a few things that I want to point out to the audience today. If you make this sum, it's not this. So where are these numbers coming from? Any idea? Permafrost soils. Mm -hmm. So if if you include that information, it is uh, it is why it's going to be offset there. But one of the questions is how accurate are these these estimates of of of, of carbon storing the soils? And this is about this is an estimate to a one meter depth. Um, and for Mexico, there was a lot of debate now it's uh, discussing that if this number accurate, what is the magic number? The other thing is that we don't have reporting uncertainty in these numbers. So there's a lot of information that is uh, that we can still work on and try to get these this, uh, this, this estimates more accurate. So there's a new effort going forward as part of the, uh, the, um, the Global Carbon Project which is recap two regional carbon cycle assessment and process study. Um, and here's the website you want to, to, uh, to look at. But the, the world is going to be divided in several regions, um, defined by colors there, and we include, include oceans. Uh, it's an activity that is just starting in 2019. We'll, we'll go all together to 2000 and, uh, 2022. Uh, we'll cover this time period. I will include CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. So one of the questions is, well, we just finished soccer Two, why we want to do now a recap for North America. Hmm? Are, the, are the findings going to be the same or are they going to be different? What is the advantage of this? Well, soccer two was only CO2 and methane, but recap will be the three gases, first of all. Second, in soccer two, we were only allowed to use information that was published. For recap, we are actually allowed to use new information that is not published. And, uh, and, uh, and that is going to Provide the different uh, different insights for the um, greenhouse gas dynamics and carbon sink and sources for North America and across the world. So let me just focus about Mexico. Who has been who has visited Mexico? Okay. Yeah, beach, center part. Yeah, beach. The beach. Uh -huh. Oaxaca and um, Guanajuato. Okay. Yeah, anyone else? No? So, and Baja. And Baja. Okay, mm -hmm. so I can ask you a question is, those landscapes are similar across? No. No? They're very it's really diverse. Exactly yeah. diverse. So that's what I was going to, is that Mexico has a high beta diversity. And uh, if you have visited Mexico, you will see that there's a lot of diversity on the landscape where you go to from one place to another. So just to give you an example, Oaxaca is somewhere here. Um, the Oaxaca City is about somewhere here, but if you can drive 
four hours from here to down, you can go to the beach, but you will pass from a uh, uh, coniferous forest to a uh, uh, tropical uh, mountain forest to tropical dry forest to arid lands, you know, and then finally get into the tropical seasonal dry forest in the coast. So in a four hours drive, you can pass for you know, four or five different ecosystem types. And that makes the richness of the diversity a problem because it's just one example. But in terms of climate, topography, yeah, and then of course the cultural diversity is huge. But this creates a problem monitoring carbon in Mexico because it's so diverse. Then where do you monitor? How you monitor? And how you how you cover all these differences in uh, ecotones and climatic zones? And this has been a big challenge that we have been working as part of the carbon monitoring systems in Mexico to move forward and describing Mexico. Now, this is, a, this is some results about the functionality of ecosystems, and I can talk with you in more detail if you want, but this is a description of ecosystem functional types. And this ecosystem functional types, this, this classification came from MODIS data, um, specifically from, uh, working with EVI data. But the, the idea of ecosystem functional type is to describe the functionality of ecosystems based on productivity, seasonality, and phenology. And the combination of these three, you know, it gives you 64 categories. So the different scholars, and I'm just going to focus on the red, green, and blue, highlighting that the pixels that have red color are dominated by productivity, the by, uh, um, that described by the EBI mean. Green are pixels that are described by seasonality, and the blue will be pixels that are in phenology. But if you see this map of Mexico, you can see that the tropical forests are defined by productivity. Then arid lands are defined, are defined by phenology. And then systems that are uh, in the in mountain regions are defined by seasonality. So this is one, one information that we try to move forward to describe the ecosystem functionality you know, in part of carbon dynamics across, across this region. A question. Yes. What's the difference between seasonality and phenology? So the seasonality is defined by the EVI coefficient of variation. It's the most important variable, and the phenology will be defined by the EV, EVI maximum. So I can I can say with you and show you. It's basically taking the time series of the of the models data and then plotting that and then it, and then dividing it by different categories. So the category that will be uh, highlighted by the mean. Uh, they will be will have a ranking on a, on a, on on the reds, and the one which is more important for seasonality will have a ranking on the greens, and the one will have phenology in the ranking of the of the blues. So um, I can go again in more detail, but basically uh, we have 64 categories because every curve, every 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 yeah every every curve is, is defined by four different categories. So this these 64 points define one of the quartiles. Of each one of those. So A would be you are in the first quartile of phenology. My, this one would be in the quartile of uh, of um, uh, of seasonality. Pro sorry, productivity. These quartiles, the um, lower 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 letters on the seasonality and the numbers on phenology. So the combination of these three will give you this key of the 64 uh, uh, um, functional types. So this was developed by Jose Paruelo. Uh, he is in uh, in in Argentina. I was I was a developer in the in the uh, 19, uh, early 1992, something like that. And then was uh, was uh, continued by one of his students, um, uh, Domingo Alcaraz, that uh, he has been helping out developing these these categories across Mexico. The point that I want to bring here is that there is a lot of diversity across Mexico, uh, also diversity in, the, in, function, in terms of functionality across ecosystems. But on top of that, there is something that is uh, important across Latin America and Mexico, that landscapes have been disturbed and they have been managed. So we have high diversity in landscapes, but also we have disturbance and different recovery trajectories. Uh, so it is, it is, this, this creates an, an, an added challenge of where do we measure, because not every forest is the same forest. So a tropical forest is not just a tropical forest, a tropical forest that has some history, history of disturbance, you know, 
that uh, from a tier forest, it can be a change in a forest cover type, or it could be simply a disturbed forest, or a degraded forest, or a secondary forest coming back from recovery. So it is, it is, a, it is really a challenge of where you measure and when to measure. And on top of that, there are limited human resources, limited economic resources, and to make things more interesting, you know, this is actually security issues. And I can tell you stories about uh, colleagues like having plots or study sites and they have to relocate them. That makes very challenging creating the carbon monitoring systems in, uh, in Mexico. Despite that, there have been a lot of efforts across the country and there has been uh, different collaborations, not only from the project that we have supported from NASA, but also from USAID and from different countries around the world. But one of the biggest efforts that happened was uh, to do um, to try to set standardized uh, methodology, methodologies across sites. There are not many sites of these intensive monitoring sites, but there are a few sites across Mexico. These are the dots, these are the names, covering different vegetation types. The idea was to create these mega sites, intensive monitoring sites, where we'll have information from an eddy covariance tower, above ground biomass, uh, soil sampling, and uh, uh, that uh, down with the breeze, also have information from LIDAR, technology, etc. And uh, these were the sites that were selected. And with that information, the idea was to move from a tier one to a tier two and a tier three information at these sites. And uh, tier one would be just uh, harmonization, uh, souls, uh, so, uh, world soil series database, for example. But we don't have that much information. Uh, tier two, is that maybe has developed, for example, a soil map, um, and you have a little bit more information. But what we would like to move is that with with a with a with a, a, to a towards a tier three, where we have a special explicit information of could be soils, could be biomass, and variables of, of, of interest, and these sites. We cannot, of course, cover the whole country because there's a lot of missing gaps, but at least at this at this uh, um, uh, intensive monitoring sites, we would like to uh, to address these uh, uh, these challenges moving towards a tier three for reporting uh, information of carbon cycle sites in Mexico. Uh, we were fortunate to have a collaboration several years ago uh, led by uh, Hans Margolis with a G Light. And, uh, he, and uh, it was uh, there were different flights, so this is available online. Uh, there are the number of flights that were uh, that were done across these areas, and I'm going to focus on the on uh, on information on, on on this area right here. This is uh, an intensive uh, monitoring site. It is a managed uh, coniferous forest. Um, it's located in the state of Hidalgo in Mexico, in this region. It's a mountain area. And each one of these sites were located within a big grid. And in the center of the grid, there's the Eddy Covariance Tower. And the plots uh, are, uh, are the um, uh, forest inventory plot plots. Um, so, characteristic of this site, it is managed by communities. Um, the, uh, you can see different uh, uh, land use types here, but mainly because of, the, of logging. So, different ages of the, of, the, of the forest and different recovery of the forest. And with this information, uh, there were uh, specific allometric equations developed for these for these sites, uh, for the specific uh, species growing there. And with that, we was able to calculate the stand gauge and the above ground biomass for each uh, for each one of these stands. And then relationships between the kind of density, kind of height, and above ground biomass for this specific site. But with the idea of moving towards a tier three of reporting, we were also uh, uh, using information from the from G Light and uh, trying to predict uh, the uh, above ground biomass at uh, five meter resolution. Let me say, and this is an example that we uh, that we did. We use uh, we tried to do predictions of above ground biomass using a linear model, so a parametric approach. Uh, general additive model, which is a non-parametric approach, and using random forest, uh, which is a machine learning approach. And uh, this is the predictions for above ground, above ground biomass. All of them seem to capture more or less the the the, uh, the, um, uh, the above ground biomass. 
Um, this model, GAM, was the one that had the largest variability, but all of them performed more or less similar. But we want to go um, uh, a step further, which was uh, calculating the uncertainty for each one of these, of, these, uh, of these models. And here, some patterns are very interesting. Whereas the linear model was very sensitive to the land use type. So uh, once uh, the model uh, got the information from the age of the forest, then this uncertainty was, was, very, uh, was very evident. Whereas this model, the GAM model, was insensitive to that information. Yeah, couldn't, 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 just, just, that it was, uh, just was no, uh, no, no, no response on that. But the random forest actually had information, was, was, was able to, I mean, was, was sensitive to some information, but it was the one that, uh, that seemed to be not, not in between these two, like not being too sensitive for you when you have information about the, 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 the land, uh, the, land uh, the management. Um, but also uh, being able not to, you know, not to uh, uh, avoid completely the information of uh, of, uh, of of the spatial variability and model runs for reporting about their biomass. Um, so this uh, this uh, workflow now can be implemented in the different um, intensive car monitoring sites, and it's being uh, shared with the colleagues across uh, across all of these uh, of these sites. And they're in the process of updating these estimates across them and see how the models will perform across each one of the different uh, um, sites. Now, I want to move forward to more on the national scale. And uh, this, is a, this is a study about mangroves across Mexico. Um, the, the Conavio made a really, really uh, good effort on mapping. Um, mangroves across uh, across Mexico, and um, we build on that information to study if there were any greenness trends in Mexico, NDVI trends. And why we were interested in that? Because there has been discussions about if mangroves are getting greener or not across the world, but there are not that many country-specific studies. So with that, the first approach was to um, Defined the different types of mangroves across Mexico. So in this in this area, there are the arid mangroves. So areas that are are are, are receive low precipitation, but they receive input from surface water. Here we have the humid mangroves, but also with inputs of surface water, but in the Pacific area. In this case, also humid mangroves, but surface water but in the Gulf of Mexico, and here in the Yucatan Peninsula, we have also humid mangroves, but with input of groundwater. So in the Yucatan Peninsula, you don't have rivers, but you have underground rivers. Um, and with those categories, we start exploring if there were any greenest trends. In, and, the, and again, just to see if it was some consistency of what hasn't reported at the global scale on greenness of these of this, uh, forests. And if in Mexico, uh, we can see some of these things. Um, just in terms of seasonality, this is and this is uh, from Jan uh, from um, uh, September to April. Um, we have NDVI, we have uh, um, temperature, and then we have precipitation. Just to have an idea of uh, of the time series. But these are the results that I want to share today. These two categories. I'm going to back going back to the to the map uh, to remind you the names. But only two categories show. Uh, positive trends on uh, on greenness, whereas other two categories there was no significant trend. So which are these two categories? These two categories are these ones here. Yeah. So mangroves that, that are influenced by surface water, but in the Pacific Zone. So do you know more or less what happened here? Like why? What do you think would be a, an issue? Like we don't see trends on the, on the other side. In agriculture on this side, there is agriculture in some of these areas now, but there are point, point, point areas. But it will not say that necessarily agriculture will be influencing all of that. Something else. Hurricanes. Yes. 
Do they come in that form? Yeah, no, well, the hurricanes are affecting all Mexico, yeah? And there are mm -hmm. hurricanes in this area, there, there are many hits. But here we also have a lot of, of disturbance. So that is one of the, of the, of the, of the potential implications about, about, uh, about this, uh, this seeing the lack of, of trains. Um, we'll look more into each one of, uh, of these areas. So now, rather than seeing the reporting, the generalities of these, uh, of these, uh, of these sites, we only try to plot like the points where we actually see those trends. So green represents a positive trend, and and uh, and uh, and uh, red represents a negative trend. And then if we pick an area, we can zoom in and we see exactly where are what is the which pixels are are, are getting those trends. So when we talk about trends, uh, these these general trends they are summarizing the generalities of the spatial scales at, at these at these larger scales, but we have more information and try to get into the where the mangroves are to see if there is any patterns at the within within a specific sites. And things get complicated, right? Because uh, these are uh, this was done with uh, with money, so it's still very large pixels. And there is opportunity to look into high special resolutions. Not every pixel is the same, yeah? but overall we can see some positive trends across some sites. Definitely, there's a mix of trends in some areas, um, which will require some further, further investigation to see why exactly those areas are getting a, a decrease or an increase. And here we come, the story is a little bit more complicated because then we will have, uh, we will need information about uh, surface water inputs or if there's any runoff, like what's happening to these parts of the, of the ecosystem or if there has been disturbance because of uh, human, human influence or because of uh, tree mortality for specific reasons, we don't, we don't have information that, that or to solve that at this, at this moment. But it's a base on information that can be used by the stakeholders, specific for Navio, to implement uh, conservation plans across Mexico. Navio has a fantastic uh, conservation program for mangroves. As I said, they map them, but this information now is, is being shared with them. There were co-authors also in this, in this study. And uh, hopefully that will have a have implication for management. In fact, I'm going um, in two weeks to talk with the Conavio and uh, start discussing this uh, uh, to see how this could be um, applicable for uh, um, conservation policy or what will be the next steps to follow. Um, that's a mangrove story. Another story that I want to share is about uh, soil carbon. And uh, here is a study that was done in the in the country of the United States and Mexico, each one of these points represents um, the uh, the a plot or a, a point in in, in the space that has information about soil carbon, and the, the, the color represents the time of the of the census of what was collected, and the size represents the the, the, the the amount of carbon that is stored. And I know I'm going too fast in this talk, but really what I want to do is just to share the wealth of information that we have across Mexico and the challenges that we have and where are we moving, again, from the plot level all the way to the, to the national scale. But I'm very happy to chat with you during the talk or after the talk, of course. Um, who noticed uh, something different between these areas, <laughs> apart from the colors? The density. The density. So this is really, really, really interesting because it's like, well, how is it possible that Mexico has so much, so many points there? So it has been a history of soil science across Mexico, yeah, uh, where uh, there have been many, many, many points, and now I have some maps to show later on. But there is a, a wealth of information about uh, about uh, soils in Mexico, which is somehow lacking in the world of the United States, considering the United States is about over two times larger than, than, than Mexico. Um, so the idea was to uh, predict soil carbon at 250 meters spatial resolution only at 30 centimeters depth. Why 30 centimeters depth? Because if you want to get deeper into the soil, you either have to have more data collected, which is as you get deeper, there's less points, or you have to develop some head of transfer functions, um, which we did, but, it, but, it, but not for this, for this study. So this is, these are the results. Uh, what we did in this study was uh, taking information from different sources, uh, following uh, um, uh, a soil science perspective, uh, thinking about soil forming factors, and, the, in, uh, and, and using a machine learning approach. So basically what it is, is 
taking cobalts that are important for salt form forming uh, salt formation, and then using random forests to predict the uh, salt organic carbon at 250 meter resolution. And this is the this is the these are the results. Uh, we were also able to calculate the variance across all the mother runs from the random forests, and uh, we have uh, an uncertainty information where the uh, uh, lighter colors of towards red represent higher uncertainty, important some uncertainty in some regions and here. Um, we, uh, we also did it with the two countries apart, and it was very interesting because the, uh, the variance or the uncertainty when you calculate for the United States without taking it into Mexico, there's a lot of uncertainty here in the border. But when we put information from Mexico, now that's uncertain to disappear. So it's, not, it's just important just to share information across across uh, across countries, but because uh, natural ecosystems they don't have political boundaries. But this is really really interesting to see how we could reduce the uncertainty of information across the United States by adding information from Mexico, because also we have more density points and in the multivariate space we can predict in different locations that may um, be relevant for the for, for the United States. So. What are the results of this analysis? Um, so we did it at 30 centimeters depth for the two countries, and we get the magic number of 46 to 47 petagrams uh, with a total model invariance of 12 petagrams. So what does this mean? This is about seven petagrams for Mexico and 39 petagrams for, uh, for, uh, for Conus. This is, this is only for the 30, 30 centimeters depth. The importance of this is that we are about 30% below previous global estimates. That's a very large number. So what is happening? So what's happening is that global estimates taking information from all the countries, all the pedants around the, around the world, doing, uh, in this case, some of the machine learning approaches, random forest usually, and predicting global estimates at 250 meter resolution. There is one led by uh, Tomislav Hengel. And those numbers, you know, the salt grids, for example, or the harmonized salt world database, are higher. So we we are emphasizing that it is important to even if you do the same approach, but it's important to do it country specific, because then is when you will have the best available information and try to do it for the specific regions in the world. We also did this exercise for all Latin America. Uh, many countries have information, but that information is not shared. Uh, globally, but when you have access to that information, and if you run this model for each one of these regions, you hopefully get a better estimate for each one of, of, uh, of, of, of the regions of interest. So uh, we think that this number is, is more close to reality than just doing a global estimate. But it's, the scary part is that it is a big, a big, a big difference. But we know that we have to move for, uh, further in Mexico, so what we try to do now is to predict a 90 meter spatial resolution and going all the way to a meter depth, because then it becomes comparable with uh, the soccer reports. Um, there have been some, uh, some attempts to do a 90 meter resolution in different countries in the world, many, many places in the world, uh, but this is the first attempt in, uh, in Mexico. So, Going back to the soccer report, it was a magic number of uh, uh, 11 petagrams, and our model it is using, it is uh, it is giving us 16 petagrams. Um, a large uncertainty, that uncertainty not to overlap with this with this number. Um, but in the in the, the advancement from from the soccer report to this unpublished data so far is that uh, we can report the uncertainty. And hopefully this, is, this, uh, this information can be incorporated into the recap analysis. So we were talking about the efforts across Mexico and all the information that is there. So these are the, the, the plots uh, for the, we have soil information. Um, they have been done by either CONA4 or INEGI, uh, different time periods. Uh, CONA4 uh, follow almost a systematic approach and INEGI a more uh, directed sampling approach. But this information is available, and this information can be incorporated into many different, uh, different resources. But also, there, is a for there are forest inventory plots. There are about 22,000 permanent uh, inventory plots. 
that has been systematically assembled um, between 2004 and and this is, this is another another graph, but it's uh, it is it has been also in the in the in the in this decade as well. But it's like this is when when, when we started when I presented the studies to people like where is this is a lot of information that is out there. Uh, so we were able now to start working with the Mexican Forest Commission with Conafor to use this information and do and try to do maps across the country with this. So. Again, using machine learning approaches um, uh, related with uh, uh, using covariates of, uh, of uh, uh, with DEMs and also with remote sensing, we can now uh, uh, share these maps at one kilometer resolution for Mexico of the different variables that CONAFOR measures. So this is a map of uh, diversity of species per hectare. Um, this is a map of total basal area. And this is a map of uh, um, uh, canopy cover. Now, this is this is something that we just were working with them, and we shared this information last year. And now we're in the process of now what? What can we do with this now? Because they could be pretty maps, but can we learn something? So now, what we want to move on in in, in our project is. If we have information about carbon dynamics, and I'm just thinking about GPP here, and uh, we can predict some trends in GPP, uh, we can maybe maybe relate that with ecosystem functional types, functionality of these ecosystems. Relate that also with some static variables, or maybe we can look at different inventory periods and, and see differences. Can we get some sort of information about hotspots for carbon dynamics in Mexico. And by these hotspots, what I mean is the changes in carbon, which are the areas that are changing the most, uh, not only by using one product, but using all the wealth information that we have at the country level. Um, so these are preliminary analysis, but there are some areas that come out as areas of interest, well, say for carbon dynamics, which are mentioned here as, as in red colors. These are preliminary results, but can we do that? And if we can do that by combining all this information, that may be useful for <coughs> management priorities across the country. But this is maybe not enough. We also want to think about attribution. Like why is this this this, this hotspot there? And it's very hard to get it there um, because we have a combination of climate-driven factors, but also human-driven factors. But we can start looking at the climate-driven factors. Are there any changes, any things that we can identify? So with these preliminary results of, of, of carbon dynamics, again, these, these, these hotspots, can we look at something? And uh, something that we're starting to play in, a, in my laboratory is looking at soil moisture. But if this is done at one kilometer resolution, the current soil moisture products are not at that resolution. So for example, SNAP and also uh, the, the ESA CCI product it is over there are over 20, 20, 20, 25 kilometers resolution. So there have been a lot of effort downscaling that. So we have been trying to, uh, to develop um, uh, uh, workflows on how to downscale uh, remote sensing soil derived soil moisture. So we are, uh, uh, this is a preliminary product to downscale the ESA uh, CCI product to one kilometer for Mexico. And we chose the ESA CCI product because it has longer time series than the SNAP. Um, so the red um, represents peak cells with negative trends, and the blue represents peak cells with positive trends in soil moisture. And again, this is very preliminary, but maybe these areas of tropical forests, they, they are, they are uh, hot spots because of carbon dynamics because there is an increase in soil moisture. Maybe here we have a hot spot. We have a, not not very clear, but we have a few areas that have higher soil moisture. But this is these are semi-arid ecosystems. Is there anything that climate-driven variables or uh, could influence these dynamics or not? We see a negative trend in the Yucatan in soil, which is surprising. What are what are these what are these climate-driven factors influencing carbon dynamics across Mexico? It's a completely open open question. Um, so. Moving into monitoring in Mexico. So we have federal driven efforts, such as the forest monitoring plots that I show you, and the soil plots that I show you, 
Those are massive efforts that, that require, that require a lot of money, a lot of people, yeah, but you can cover the whole, the whole country. There are also bottom-up uh, uh, efforts like, driven by PI specific scientists. And uh, one of those is uh, the, 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 the MECFLOX, which is a Mexican eddy covariance network. So eddy covariance is a technique to measure the exchange of mass and energy between landscapes and ecosystems. Um, so there are towers located in these areas. You immediately can see that there is a cluster in this area, and it's like, that's why there are so many towers there. Are those ecosystems the most, most interesting ones or not? Well, what happened is that people will put their towers where they can access them, where they can measure it. And it just happened to be that uh, uh, there's a very strong group working in this area that have been um, uh, monitoring uh, ecosystem scale fluxes with this technique for a long time. And that is why this network is there. Problem with the network like this is that the sites are not located in the best places. You locate the site where you can measure that which is great because you can have uh, uh, the, the, the people that are interested in working and measuring where they consider it the most interesting, but it's accessible to them. But then when you think about the national scale, this creates a problem, you know? So there's always this, this, this balance between a network that is uh, structured versus a network that is driven by, 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 by scientists. And you can see here in the United States, what it will be called to Ameriflux, which is a PI-driven network, and you have NEON, which is a top-down approach. So this is more following the Ameriflux protocol where PIs are the software to monitor and, and, and for, for, for how long, and, and the problem with that is that these networks are limited by resources because the resources depend on, on projects that the PIs will do, and then you may get a project for two years, for three years, maybe for five years, but then what? So there is this paradox of networks because everyone wants the data, everyone records and recognizes that the data is very important, but who is going to collect it and how long we can, we can do uh, these networks or what, for how long we can maintain them. That said, we're using information from eddy covariance across the world in many, 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 for many studies. And the, 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 the network of networks of eddy covariance towers is called FluxNet. And, uh, we use these global, global databases, but it's important to ask, you, to ask how representative are these networks? I mean, it's what we have, but how representative it is. So we did a study for Mexico to, say, to, to test if the current Maxflux design is representative of not for GPP measurements or ET measurements, ET evapotranspiration measurements. And just to see how far are we from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, from having a good uh, network representativeness. So the result is that we can only capture about 3% of the variability of GPP in Mexico, and about 5% of the variability of ET in Mexico. It's at 14 sites. It's a big problem. No? Um, again, why is this? Because Mexico is very diverse. But on top of that, the towers are not located in the right places. So can we do better? Well, how many towers do we need? Like, okay, just put 200 towers. Well, the United States, the American Flux, has about 200 towers historically that have been on and off, and it's still not enough for the United States. I'm going to show you some results at, at the end. So, so, so in this country, for this region, is what can we do? So it's a, it's a top-down approach saying, where are we going to collect these sites it's going to be better, or we just simply have to put more towers in the right places? So we did this analysis, and uh, we said, this is the current configuration of network, of making Maxflux. I would say, what if we have seven sites but in the right places? What if we have 14, 28, or 84 sites in the right places? What is that, is that going to change the representativeness of GBP and ET for making? So, Maxflux has 14 sites representing about 3%. Um, um, but if we have 14 sites um, uh, in the right places here, we basically double the prediction. This is, uh, so uh, GBP is about 5% 5, uh, 5 and ET about 8%, 8, 8 for the, so for 14 sites in the right places. But if we have 84 sites in the right places, we get about 45% of GBP and ET. Yeah, sorry, there was just a, there's a, 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 there's a typo there. No, but it's about 45% of GBP and ET with 84 sites in the right places. 
and we double the information of methods if we have 14 sites in the right places. Now, is this is possible? Sounds like a good idea, no? But it's not. It's, it's, it is a little bit uh, not, not realistic because first of all, having 84 sites, it is it is it's impossible because they're not the human resources. Even if we could get money to buy infrastructure for 84 sites, who is going, who's going to run these, these places? And with even 84 sites, we don't get to get about only 50% of the special representativeness of Mexico. So this has important implications for, for validation, you know, and for the remote sensing products, for modeling products, etc. Because it will be very, very challenging to for 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 uh, uh, validation across across our region, then we we'll say, well, what if we go for a for a, for, a, for a smaller set? We have built let's say fourteen sites in the right places. Okay, we may have the human resources to do that. We may have the economic resources to do that. But the problem now is that the sites are not where the people are. So a lot of it's towers together because that's where people can manage them. They can drive. But if you set the different sites, who's going to drive and get to these areas? So it's a, it's a, again it's a problem. Of, of networks. And these are the results of Ameriflux. So the historical Ameriflux archive, and what this means is using all the all the sites where, where Ameriflux have these towers. Some sites have run only for one year. Some sites they are still there. Yeah? But if we assume that even if a site has the Philippines have has was well located and assuming that one year of information that is in the in the Meriflux network is enough to provide some something some information about that location. If we run this analysis of representativeness, we see that in this. Uh, oh, and by the way, these are these uh, these uh, regions are neon domains. We see that one, two, three, four, five neon domains. Yeah, there is low representativeness. Yeah, or what are the ones with the lowest representativeness? On the other hand. If we just go and look only at the neon network, where there's a neon core and relocatable sites, which are less than number of flux, we're talking about like 84 sites, then we see that there is there's a lot of information that is missing. They can only represent, for example, one percent of this domain of these of these four domains. This is a big problem because even from a top-down approach, where you have the best infrastructure, you try to put it in the best place. They are very limited to represent a very, the variability of a large region, region. So a good approach was to combine information from the Ameriflux and Neon core sites. So here are only sites that are the Neon plus Ameriflux that have long-term funding, not PI-driven, yeah, but just sites that have long-term long-term funding. Why? Because then these sites will at least be there for a decade, whereas my study site has five years of data, but I don't know if I can run that for another three years. Yeah, but assuming that these sites uh, are going to be for long term, now the combined effort that Meriflux and Neon Core sites change this information. Yeah, showing that we uh, combining network efforts uh, would be for the for the better good for representativeness, and this case is uh, for GPP across the United States. So the last thing that I want to share today is about interoperability, and uh, this is a buzzword. And uh, when we think about interoperability, we usually talk about what I'm calling technical interoperability. Uh, and that is uh, compatibility of information technologies like data, data standards, infrastructure, monitoring capabilities, etc. But interoperability goes beyond just the technical issues. There are different barriers. In fact, there are conceptual, technological, organizational, and cultural barriers. And this is important when we're talking about networks across regions, but also networks among different countries with different cultures. So the idea is that we have low interoperability, it would be very difficult to cooperate, to produce knowledge, to have leadership. But if we have high interoperability, we'll have less barriers, and we can move forward to a science policy integration, adaptive management, and adaptive governance. But what I want you to remember from this talk are what are the barriers of interoperability. So conceptual barrier. Conceptual is defined as, uh, for example, the syntactic and semantic differences, such as sampling protocol, the network designs, the high-level model abstraction. Like how are we going to do things? 
The technological are the ones that we discussed, and probably most of you are familiar with this. And then there are organizational barriers, and then that those are the ones that uh, uh, the definition of, of the responsibility and authority, who is going to do what. And this is important at the national level because there are different agencies that may have competing interests. And in some areas, it will be complicated to see who, who, which agency is going to take the lead for specific things, or which, is, or which institutions we are not going to the very, very high level. And finally, we usually don't talk about this in science, but there are cultural differences. There are cultural differences in terms of data sharing, the speed of I work, how I communicate with you. And you can see that there's cultural differences between different domains in science. If you're talking with an engineer and you're talking with a, um, a, um, like a biologist, we are talking with a, a force, uh, someone for sciences, etc. But But these cultural differences, we sometimes forget about those, but they're extremely important to um, uh, to move towards uh, integration of this inter barrier. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. I just want to say thank you again to NASA CMS program, and thank you for you uh, for having me here.